So um, I'm going to be joined, as I said, by uh, Jonathan, and uh, we found Jonathan's um, information, one of the names that was recommended to us by Bedvers, who they'd like to actually see and kind of hear from on uh, the webinar, and Jonathan's going to be kind of showing his uh, images. Now, if this is the first web a webinar what, that you've been uh, on at all, at this stage you should be hearing my voice. I will disappear soon, I promise, or I'll be replaced by Jonathan. Um, but what you should be seeing is the wildlife in the garden, or in my garden, um, slide with uh, a couple of uh, hares, I'm sure the hares or rabbits, I'm sure Jonathan will correct me as soon as he comes on live and so on. Um, so again, that's what you should be hearing. If you've got any questions, um, there's a question panel, and uh, if you just want to actually type anything in there, any ask, ask questions towards Jonathan, we'll get to those uh, towards the end of the presentation as such. Uh, all these live at lunch webinars are designed to run for an hour, so it allows you to kind of eat and watch and kind of enjoy yourself as well as uh, get, uh, get back to work without being told, uh, told off as such. So I think that's enough about me. We're nearing that time of five, of five past one. So on behalf of myself and the Photographer Academy, welcome Jonathan. Uh, thank you very much indeed. It's a pleasure to be here. Um, I'm really glad that we managed to uh, sort out um, all the sound little problems that we had beforehand, so very, very good. Um, I would like to give you the heads up, really, those who are watching, um, the images that we're going to be seeing, uh, obviously, because it's just a PowerPoint kind of presentation on screen, they're not going to look as sharp or as clear um, as um, uh, the images that we're kind of going to be able to see from any photographer. Um, if you do want to see Jonathan's work, then you can go to his website, his website directly. Uh, Jay's put that into the uh, chat panel now. So so um, he sent that off to you all, and you'll be able to link off to his uh, site following the show and so on. So basically, um, Jonathan, when, when did you get into photography? Oh, it was a long time ago, actually, now, because I'm guessing a bit of an old man. But uh, I, I would imagine it was probably in the early 70s originally, um, when I used to use military equipment. And then over the years, I gradually moved on to Canon, onto the EOS system, and then I went on to the... Um, digital system with uh, the uh, 7D, the 20D, and the 50D cameras. Uh, so I've been digital now uh, since about 2006 or something like that. Brilliant. Uh, I'm not sure if you can just stay at the same distance away from your speaker for me, uh, sorry, from your microphone, and make sure you don't use any hands in front of your face and things, if you could do. Just uh, I lost a little bit of sound there, kind of thing with it. Uh, Jonathan, I'm going to hand over the screen to you. I know I'm going to be presenting as far as pressing the button to go to the next slide and so on. So please just say next, and I'll move on as we go, kind of thing with it. So without any further ado, uh, ladies and gentlemen, Jonathan Ashton, take it away. Thank you very much indeed. Um, today um, I want to talk about some of the wildlife that might be seen uh, in anybody's garden, but specifically in mine. Oh, sorry, this could not have happened worse. There's somebody banging at my door. Could you just excuse me for one moment, please? I can do that for you. <laughs> there's, all, there's always a time, isn't there, where uh, <laughs> things kind of go. I'm just going to press the stop recording for a minute. So remember, uh, if you've got any questions, uh, I can see a few of you saying hello. It's brilliant to actually hear, and it's all it's also good to hear where you are from around the world as well. So please kind of drop into the chat panel, uh, the question panel there. Um, just uh, just going through it. Jay, do we have any competitions running today on the face the Facebook page? Uh, Jay says we're going to be running a competition later on, so uh, check out the Facebook page later on. So uh, right, uh, it sounds like Jonathan's back. He's received yes, the package. Let me press record, record again, and we'll start recording again. So let's go with it, Jonathan. All right. My, my apologies for disappearing then. The, the postman came to the door, would you believe, of all times. Anyhow, uh, what I wanted to talk to you today about was uh, wildlife in my garden. Um, I do a lot of photography in the garden uh, of birds, and I also do macro work as well. And by macro, I mean I do uh, mainly dragonflies and damselflies, but also butterflies and flowers and other forms of insects as well. But uh, for today's purposes, um, I wanted to uh, really concentrate on the birds. And some of the images that you might be able to take readily in your garden, uh, and I'm going to talk very briefly about some of the images here. They're not necessarily the best images that I've got, but I thought that they might be good for illustrative purposes and then perhaps uh, encourage you to ask questions as to how you think some of them may have been better or what, what alternatives you might want to propose, etc. So without further ado, let, let's have a look at the, uh, the first picture then, please. Now then, 
this is a, a picture of a bullfinch, and this is just to try and give you an indication of how you might go about capturing an image. Obviously, on the left-hand side of the picture, there are some seeds, and the bird has been attracted to the seeds, so I place the perch by the feeder. Now, the picture of, of the bird isn't too bad, but it's obviously not what you want. So if we now move on to the second one, please. Here, you can see that I've obviously cropped out the feeder, I've, and if you look carefully at the right-hand side of the perch, I've extended the perch very slightly so that there's a little bit of space behind the bird's tail uh, compared to the other image where the tail was close to the uh, right-hand side of the frame. So I've improved the presentation a little bit, and I think that that is probably an acceptable image. Uh, as mentioned before, though, the image quality is not quite what it should be, uh, but if you look on the website, it will be fine. Let's have a look at the next one. Now then here, I've put one or two numbers uh, on the uh, image. Number one is referring to the fact that when you're taking a picture of a bird, it always pays to make sure that you are focused on the bird. Now that's not intended to be a sarcastic comment. Um, the key part of the bird's focus is around the eye. So when you're focusing, make sure that you select a focus point that is on the eye, and if necessary, lock the uh, AF on your camera and then reposition the camera to ensure that the, the bird is uh, put in a suitable place in the frame, as it were. The second point I've got on this particular image is it looks a little bit more interesting than a straightforward shot. Uh, because the bird's bill is obviously open, so that obviously attracts a little bit of interest. And number three, uh, I put number three there because really, uh, having said that the shot of the bird isn't too bad, there is a lot of empty space down there on the right hand side. So it begs the question really, what is the bird doing and what is it making a fuss about? Uh, so really, uh, do you want that much space on the right hand side or should there have been something there that would indicate what the bird was communicating to? So whilst it's not a bad image, it's not a brilliant image. So these are some of the things I would like to bring to your attention. And the next one please. Now then here we have a long tailed tit. Um, this is a, a really cute little bird. Um, um, I think many people would want to get a shot of one of these in, in their back garden. Now, there are a few things here that I, I would like to draw your attention to. Uh, number one, in the top left hand corner there, the bird is on quite an interesting perch. Uh, and I'm saying this because uh, it's obviously got uh, mosses on it, and um, it, it looks reasonably attractive, but not to the extent that it's taking too much attention away from the bird. But if you notice carefully where the number one is, the perch is actually going out of the frame and coming back in, in again. So that really doesn't make for excellent presentation. Number two is referring to the muted background. Uh, you notice that in most of the images so far, the background has been quite soft and muted. Uh, this is something that um, I've written about on my website in one of the links there. I can't emphasize strongly enough how important it is to have a nice clear background. Number three shows you the, um, the position of the bird. Now at first glance you might think it's fine, but in actual fact the bird is almost head on. Uh, and it doesn't make for optimum presentation. And this is something I shall be alluding to a little bit more later on. Uh, number four, uh, the bird's tail is out of focus. This is a lack of depth of field. This is something that would be particularly difficult to get with a, a bird like this because the tail is very long. Uh, so there again, there are a few points there that you might want to consider when photographing birds of that sort of shape and size. So the next one, please. Right, now then, here we have a blue tit, and it's interested in this log here because there are some peanuts hidden inside the log. And uh, you can see uh, there are some holes in the log, and this is where I actually inserted the, the peanuts. Now, I've written one or two reference points here. Number one uh, is showing you that the bird is more or less in profile. Uh, but, if anything, the bird is looking very slightly away from the camera. 
and that's not an ideal thing. And we'll come on to that again a little bit later again. Uh, number two, uh, what I'm referring to here is, is that the, the bird is perhaps a little bit on the bright side. There's a lack of colour and definition in the plumage there. And number three uh, is the log. Now, the picture, it sounds an obvious thing to say, the picture is all about the bird. It's not all about the log. So in this image, you can see that one of the dominant factors, in fact, one of the things that keeps pulling my eye, is the log. So what I would tend to do then is, having got the bird to this position, I would perhaps reorientate the log so that I could take an image whereby I wouldn't have to include so much of it. So there's more of the bird and less of the log. Uh, and then number four, here I'm referring to the background. Now whilst it's nicely out of focus, uh, it is rather blotchy. In other words, there's areas of contrast where there's dark, pale and medium tones. Uh, and that's a little bit uh, distracting to the eye. So, all in all, there are quite a few faults with that image, but at first glance you might think it's not too bad a shot. Okay, the next one, please. Now then, this is uh, getting a little bit better now, isn't it? Here we can see that we've got a blue tit, and number one, he's on an attractive perch. Number two, uh, he is, I'm sorry, I'm, I'm saying number two, there aren't any numbers on this image. The first thing is he's on the perch. The second thing to note is that uh, his pose, if you like, is quite an interesting one. He's got a little bit of an itch and he's having a scratch. You can quite clearly see his eye. The bird is nicely in focus and he's got this little leg stuck up in the air. So all in all, that's quite a pleasing image and the background is nice and clear as well. So I, I would think that is a significant improvement on some of the others. Now, in this image here, uh, it's very uh, often a, a good idea to try and include something of interest within the image insofar that just one bird is one bird and you take another bird and then you get another one another one and it becomes a little bit repetitive. So if you can get a bird with several, uh, an, an image I should say, with several birds in the picture, it's not a bad thing. So here, number one, you see we've got a nice clear background. Uh, but number two, one bird is facing away, so that's not too brilliant. Number three, you see there's something there that catches the eye, that piece of orange. It's where the bark has uh, been peeled away from the perch. So that's not a good thing either. Number four, we've got the bird nicely in focus there, but the bird is actually looking outside the frame. So that's not an ideal thing either. Uh, so ideally, it should be the other way around, looking into the frame. And number five, that one's not too bad, but the bird is looking downwards. So we're getting things a little bit more, uh, shall we say, visually interesting, but at the same time, it's not all quite coming together. But those are the sorts of things that you might want to bear in mind with an image like that. Here we have uh, another shot of a blue tit, and uh, it's not a bad image at all. The, the sky is perhaps a little bit on the, the bright and uninteresting side, but we've got the bird on a fairly interesting perch, and we've got good eye contact good detail in the plumage, and all in all, uh, the bird is sitting about in the right place and size within the frame. Next one, please. Now then, uh, apart from birds being on perches, these are very often called bird on a stick images. It's a bit of a disparaging comment to make, uh, but they can rather look very similar. So if you can get images looking a little bit more uh, different in terms of their poses and the perches. And then the next thing you might want to consider is, can you actually catch the birds in flight? And here, this can be very simply achieved by having the feeder. You can imagine that the feeder would be on the right-hand side of the frame here, and the bird has just been on the feeder, and it's leapt off it to take away and fly off. Uh, and to be able to get a shot like this, I place the lens in manual focus mode, I focus on the aperture on the bird feeder, and then I move the camera to one side so that when the bird leaves the feeder, I can fire the shutter using the cable release. And again, we know we've got a nice muted background and it's of interesting colours. 
Here, um, again, you, you might think, uh, why on earth are you taking this on barbed wire? Well, this is the sort of thing that you do see in the country sometimes when sheep have been in the field. The birds come down and pluck some of the wool off the barbed wire to uh, use it as nesting material. So uh, that was one of the reasons that uh, I included this sort of thing. So in actual fact, th this was not, this particular image wasn't actually in the back garden, but I have uh, made this better insofar that I've taken a similar image using a piece of rusty old barbed wire which looks far more photogenic. And I've got similar images of birds where I have taken them in the back garden. And the next one please. Uh, now then, this was taken in the back garden and this little clump of blackberries was placed near the feeder. So the bird is more interested in the seeds that are in the feeder. So lo and behold, it comes down and perches on these berries and it makes for a rather photogenic, pleasing image. Um, so that one, the other thing I'd like to draw to your attention is if you look carefully at the bird, the head is very slightly turned towards the camera and that makes an enormous difference. If you've got the, the head pointing uh, at right angles to the camera, the bird isn't really looking at all at you, it's looking away. But if it's just a very slight head turn towards the camera, it makes all the difference and you feel more engaged with the subject. The next one please. Here again, rather than just birds on a stick, try and think of different things to make the shot a little bit more interesting. Now here, as you can well imagine, the feeder was on the right hand side of the image, out of the frame, and I placed this uh, flower stalk with the, uh, the dead head, it's, it's an umbiliferous plant, um, and the bird had been perched on there and it was just about to leave it to go onto the feeder. So again, here I focused uh, initially on the head of the plant, put the camera lens to manual focus, got the bird there and then as soon as I sensed it was about to move, I fired the shutter using the remote release. Next one please. Um, this one here, we've got the bird on a slightly unusual perch. Uh, this is a cold tit, uh, but the thing is that it doesn't quite work, does it? The, the stem that the bird is perched on is a little bit eye-catching and it could do with toning down a little bit, in, in other words making it less bright and then it wouldn't interfere so much. And that seed head, um, is it really necessary? Does it need to be there? I don't think so. I, I think the image might have been stronger had number one, the image been made into a vertical, in other words portrait sort of image and the stem would have been toned down and then the presentation would have been, been improved somewhat. Next one please. Now, uh, here again we have a more interesting shot. Before we had a, a bird perched on the brambles, well this time we got the bird perched near the brambles, but it's actually just about to take off and it makes the picture look that bit more dynamic again. So here we've got some nice, bright, interesting berries. We've got a wonderfully uh, sympathetically coloured background. And we've actually got the bird showing some action. We've got one foot that's uh, firmly planted, the other one that's very slightly blurred. And you can see there's a little bit of movement in the wingtips. And we've still got good eye contact as well. So that's uh, a pretty reasonable image in my, in my estimation, that one. And the next one, please. Now this is something that I had to wait quite some time for. When you have a feeder, you obviously uh, have multiple ports on the feeder. So what I tend to do when I want to do photography is to block up all the ports apart from one. So the birds very often have to queue up to get the, to the seeds. And here we've got a sparrow on the right hand side who wants to get onto the feeder. Uh, and the goldfinch on the left hand side is becoming very impatient indeed. He wants the sparrow to get out of the way so that he can get to it. So if you can get sort of interaction between birds, I think that this uh, adds for more interest and variation within your portfolio. And the next one please. Uh, 
this is this is a, a shot that uh, a lot of people do, and I included it just to show you how it was done. This is a, a teasel head and a goldfinch. Now goldfinches do feed on teasel, and so what I do, uh, I now grow teasel in my back garden. Uh, but at this particular point, there weren't any seeds on the teasel head. So what I did, uh, I got some fine Niger seeds, which are tiny black seeds that you can get from any pet shop, uh, and I sprinkled them onto the teasel head. And the teasel head I placed near a feeder. So the birds were in any event attracted to the feeder. And then when the goldfinches see the Niger seeds on that particular seed head, they would go for it. And here again, you can see I've got the nice muted background, and I've taken the image uh, at a time of day where I've got the light falling almost perpendicular to the bird. In other words, at right angles to the bird, sort of flat on as it were. Not quite flat on, but near enough. And the next one, please. Here again, uh, a little bit different. Uh, we've got a J, and he's on a stump, and he's got an acorn. Um, there's probably no prizes for guessing that the acorn was actually placed inside the stump. The very t if, you, if you were able to look down onto the stump, you would see that it was hollowed out. Uh, and I placed one or two acorns in there in the hope that I would get a jay or a magpie or something like that coming down. Uh, and lo and behold, the jay came down and took the acorn to cue and then managed to snap the image. And there again, uh, the key thing is the eye is pin sharp. So um, that's just another trick for Jays. Next one, please. Now, we very often see uh, people taking shots of woodpeckers. Uh, so if you, and if you're lucky enough to get them in your back garden, uh, number one, try and get them to come down to an interesting post or perch. Uh, number two, uh, try and get them doing something. So. If you put peanuts or ground, ground nuts with fat or whatever in the log, uh, try and place it so that it's well within the log and so the bird actually has to do a little bit of work to get to it. So here you can see the woodpecker has been pecking away at the woods in order to get to the fat and the peanuts. And you can actually see the chips and splinters coming out of the log and I think that that improves the presentation and makes the image a little stronger and more interesting than a straightforward picture of a woodpecker on a stick, if you like. Now then, this one, uh, a very common bird, uh, and uh, we've got a little pool of water here uh, with a suitably positioned stone, and lo and behold, the bird comes down, he wants to have a drink, and just before he has a drink, he has a quick look around, so you try and get in with a nice light, and the thing that struck me about this one was all the sympathetic colours. So, um, you know, there's an enormous variety of birds in the garden. Don't forget the most common ones and the ones that you sometimes might regard as irritating, like wood pigeons, because they are rather photogenic. Now, here we have a, a nut hatch, and this is on a, um, a tree, um, I've lost the word, tree trunk. Uh, and um, what I did, I actually put some peanuts into the coarse bark of the tree trunk to attract the nut hatch. And then what I did after that, when I actually got the image on the computer, I used the clone and patch tools to disguise the fact that the peanuts were there, so you can't actually see them. And here I've got a, a nice pose of the nut hatch, rather than looking at the log. It's looking away, but it's still engaging you because you can see the eye quite clearly. So those are some of the things that I would like to draw your attention to on that image. And the next one. Now then, this is a, a starling, and the appearance of starlings changes throughout the year. The plumage changes, and here I was after a photogenic or, or a pretty an inverted commas type image, whereby I wanted to try and get some of the green iridescence in the plumage matching the green background and the green perch, and along with a, a very pleasant pose. So it's not the usual shot that you would expect to see of a sterling perhaps, but I think that that is uh, one of the things that makes it. So always try and think of things to, to modify so that you can get a more interesting image than somebody else might have taken under similar circumstances.
Next one, please. Uh, now, th this is a, a genuine shot. Um, this happened to be uh, an old tree, uh, and the branches were growing just like that. And to all intents and purposes, it, it looks rather like a swing. And I was lucky enough to actually get the magpie on there, and I made a little click noise like that, just to try and get his attention. And as he turned around, I snapped the picture. Again, focusing on the eye, uh, and so it makes for a slightly more interesting view. Uh, rather than seeing facing you with his chest facing towards you, that one is looking over the shoulder. We don't very often get siskins in the garden, but when we do, uh, I always try and make sure I get them. So here, uh, I've tried to get a sympathetic shot of the siskin on a perch with colours that reflect the, shot, the, uh, the plumage of the siskin. And again, note the good eye contact. Next one, please. This is the male siskin, the previous was the female. And this was the rusty barbed wire that I alluded to earlier on in the presentation. And whilst the shot of the siskin isn't bad, you can see he's literally looking from left to right. In other words, he's at right angles to you as the viewer. Uh, and it doesn't quite come about. And the other thing, of course, is that the barbed wire is curled up behind his tail. So that's what I would call a nearly shot. Not quite there. The next one, please. Jonathan, before I go on to the next image, uh, the most common question I've got going through is lens yeah. and aperture. What, what's your yeah. favourite lens and what's your main aperture? Because everybody's loving all this out-of-focus kind of background and so on. So if you, can you just explain that a little bit for us? Yeah. Um, now then, these shots were taken over a number of years, actually. So some of them were taken with a 100 to 400 millimetre lens, and some of them were taken with a 500 millimetre lens. And... Let's start first of all with the 100 to 400 lens. Um, the size of the bird in the frame will be dictated by the distance that you are from the subject. So if you're using a, a crop frame camera like a, a 20D, 50D or a 7D, uh, I find that with the 400mm lens you need to be a, somewhere between 9, 9 to 12 feet. So that's sort of 3 meters, 4 meters maximum away. Ideally, you'd be nearer the three meters. And the aperture that I would use uh, would be in the region of around about uh, 7.1, something like that. Now then, with the 500 millimeter lens, uh, you can afford to be uh, sort of 11 to 12 feet away, again, depending upon the size of the bird. And the aperture that I would choose would be in the region of around about 7.1 again. That's not to say I don't sometimes use a, a wider aperture on the 500mm lens. I do. But it's all to do with magnification, you see. Your depth of field will be governed by one thing, and that is the magnification. In other words, the size of the bird in the frame. So if you shoot the bird close up with whatever the lens, the depth of field will be the same at a given aperture. I'll say that again. If you shoot an image of a bird and it's the same magnification with a 100 to 400 lens or a 500 lens, the depth of field will be the same if you use the same aperture. So um, really what you've got to concern yourself with primarily is how far away from the bird you are and from that you'll be able to judge which aperture to use. But as a starting point, I would say something like 6, 6.1, 7.1, uh, something like that. Um, and don't forget that if the light goes away a bit, you can drop it down to 5.6. But you may find that by doing that, as indeed this image shows you here, the very tip of the tail is not quite sharp, but the bill is. That would probably have been in the region of around about 5.6, that particular shot would have been that we're looking at now. Does that answer the question? It, it does perf uh, perfectly. Thanks very much. I must have had 25 people asking the same question, Jonathan. That was all. Okay. <laughs> Sorry about that. Right. Uh, carry on, please. Thank you. Right. Now then, uh, while we're looking at this picture, just try and bear it in mind, because I want to now move on to the next picture very quickly, please, if possible.
Now then, can you, can you see the difference straight away? The first picture, it, it was pretty sharp and the colours were nice and all the, all the rest of it, but this image, it looks much more, I'm going to say the word, eye-catching. Now why is that? Can you see the difference? Let's go back. There you go. What we've got here is that slight head turn that I was alluding to previously. And that slight head turn just gets you instantly, you go straight to the eye and you're compelled to look at the bird, aren't you? And there, uh, I, you can see that the bird, the plane of the bird is such that I've got the eye and the bill in focus and the tip of the tail as well. Uh, now that one would, not, would have been around about, um, let me think, 11 to 12 feet away from the camera uh, with a 500mm lens. So that one would have probably been in the region of f7.1, I would say. Okay? And the next shot, please. There again, uh, I'm trying to illustrate this point about the, the very slight head turn. Had that bird been looking directly to the right, the image would not have been so engaging. But here, the other thing that helps make uh, for a slightly interesting image is the, the foot, the way that it's resting there. That just improves the image a little bit. Now, this little chap here, uh, we don't get many of these in the garden at all. This is a, a red pole, and this is the male. And typically, they uh, go for pine trees. Now, at that particular time, I didn't have a pine tree in the garden, so I found an old pine twig and placed it in a suitable position near a feeder and managed to get the shot that I wanted. Now, whilst I've got the nice picture of his uh, plumage, uh, I'm not exactly thrilled with the head position on that one, but it's not too bad. This is the female. She doesn't look quite so uh, pretty, uh, but the, the, the actual pose is perhaps a little bit more engaging because of the position of the head. And the next one. If you can, try and get uh, natural pictures of the birds where they're actually doing things, not, not just feeding or calling or fighting. This one is actually collecting nest material. And this uh, blackbird did actually build a nest at the side of the house in a grapevine and successfully reared a few chicks. And the next one. This uh, shot of a robin uh, he was uh, on a twig next to the feeder, and he was playing merry hell, if I can use that word. Um, there was another robin nearby who wanted to keep coming down for food, <coughs> Excuse me, and he was having none of it. He was saying, you stay away, this is mine. Uh, and I managed to catch him just at the peak of activity there, where he was really uh, screaming and shouting at the other bird. And the next one. Here we have uh, a robin in the snow. Um, I photographed from uh, various hides in the back garden, and I'm lucky enough now to actually have, um, I suppose you'd call it an overgrown shed, really. It's a, it's a building that we use for multiple functions, but I can actually open the window in the shed, uh, sit on a comfortable seat, uh, and mount the camera uh, and uh, the um, tripod head onto a fixed shelf uh, and I can sit down in comfort and have a cup of tea or put the fan heater on or anything like that uh, and take images in comfort whilst it's cold outside. So uh, you can see the snowdrops, the, uh, the snowflakes I should say they're actually resting on the bird as well. So that, that helps to uh, emphasize the situation and uh, improve image content. Next one. Uh, this is a picture of a wren, um, and it was just collecting uh, bits of moss for nesting material, and uh, it was really fortuitous. Uh, I just spotted this, and I happened to have, uh, this, this sounds ridiculous, I just happened to have the 500mm uh, lens in my hand at the time. It wasn't on um, ready mode. I just turned it on very quickly and snatched the image and uh, lo and behold uh, I was very pleasantly surprised. I wasn't expecting it to be sharp but it is sharp uh, and I, th I think that's probably the last image is it?
Uh, yeah, it is the last image, Jonathan, but we've got loads and loads of questions here, so we don't mind actually kind of doing those before we kind of go on. <clears throat> For those right. of you, um, sorry, let me just uh, make sure I'm seeing what you are. Um, if you haven't had a chance to actually whip over to Jonathan's um, kind of photography site yet and things really, I mean, I've been looking at some of the macro photography, I think it's absolutely stunning, so we're definitely going to be getting uh, you back or spending a day in your garden, I think we'll, we'll be hounded by members forever if we don't actually arrange that. Um, we'll just, just put that out in the chat box for you again, I know Jane's, uh, Jay's done that already, but I'll just do it again, just so you can just go from here. Question for you, um, Jonathan, just um, first, first of all, I should say that people are absolutely loving all your images and so on, so thank you so, so much for actually agreeing to do this. Um, is there any books that you have out uh, that go, uh, go through any of the, um, tech, the techniques or your explanation or any e-books or anything that you've done? Uh, no, I haven't uh, actually written any books. I've written a, a couple of articles that, that are actually on the website. Um, uh, I've written articles for the uh, SWPP magazine and those are actually on the site and can be um, looked at uh, without any problem at all, free of charge. Um, with regards to uh, books that I've actually uh, looked at, um, I've looked at, at all the, the big names uh, and I, w I wouldn't necessarily recommend any particular one above a, a, another. Um, Laurie Campbell, Neil Benby, um, oh, Eric Hosking was the original person who fired up my enthusiasm for bird photography. But uh, the thing is that um, w when, you look, when you're looking for tips, one of the first things that I say to people is when they buy a camera, uh, do they actually read the manual that comes with the camera? Because, you know, it's full of useful information. And the vast majority of people just don't do that. So I think that's a very good starting point. I'm one of those. <laughs> <laughs> I know I should read it more, but I just never get around to doing it. Um, okay, uh, focusing on, on the bird in flight, have, have you got any tips and tricks to actually be doing that? Yes, yes. Uh, now then, let's, uh, let's take it one step at a time here. If you are photographing a bird that you know is going to be flying from left to right or right to left, it's obviously in the sky, but by that I mean you've got a clear background. Then you can select several focus points in your, well, depending upon your camera, you might select one or, or several focus points. If you've got something like um, a 7D camera, you can select a single or a group or a whole block of points. Now, if you're against a, a, um, a simple background, that's fine. If you're uh, taking the bird and the bird is passing in front of trees or something like that, then I would definitely not recommend that. I would always use a single point, a single focus point. The other thing, of course, you always set the camera to servo. Uh, in other words, it's continuous focus. Uh, and uh, I engage the image stabilizer as well. Now, the image stabilizer on my Canon lenses, there's, there's mode 1 and mode 2. On the more modern lenses that have recently come out, I think there's three or maybe even four modes. Um, so you'd have to check which mode to use. But the mode that I use means that you can uh, get the camera to compensate for lateral movements. So that is mode 2. And in actual fact, I leave the camera lenses on mode 2 for all photography. All of the okay. time. And okay. what about pa uh, panning? Obviously, are you on tripod yeah. the whole uh, the whole time? Can you just explain yeah. a little bit about the whole technique set setup wise? Yeah, there's a bit of both here. Uh, with the big lens, I can hand hold it uh, even with a converter, but uh, your arms do become tired after a while. So I actually use uh, a tripod with um, a special head on it that this is suitable for panning and tilting. Uh, they're, they're called gimbal heads. And um, the one that I use is uh, a very lightweight job, and I get it from America. Uh, the most common one that's used is the, um, uh, oh, I've got the name of it now. But I, I don't use the most popular one. It'll come back to me later on. I, I use, um, no, I've gone completely blind. I'll find out for you before the, the end of the seminar. I'll find out. Oh, oh. 
or perhaps you could just send us the information on a quick email and Jay can post it on the Facebook page yeah, so that anybody wants to actually kind of see it would be great on that with it. Um, yeah. uh, going back to um, uh, panning and things really, is that something that yeah. you do a lot or is it, are you yeah. looking for a still image more? Uh, I, I do both because um, we're, we're now coming up to October uh, in, and uh, over the next couple of weeks the short eared owls will be arriving. Uh, and I go down to Park Gate there to focus, focus on them there. Now here uh, I use panning technique and I also use something called focus bumping. That's B-U-M-P-I-N-G. Uh, it's not an official term, it's just a term that's been adopted by an American photographer. And what I do is <clears throat> I focus very briefly on the bird and follow it round. I don't leave my finger on the button to maintain focus. I just sort of track it every now and again so that the lens is in focus, we're going a bit further, just check it's in focus and then I only actually press the uh, finger on the shutter uh, permanently as it were to, to, to engage full focus and fire the shutter. I actually only do that when I intend to take the image. So I'm maintaining approximate focus all the time rather than trying to keep permanent focus on the, all the time and I think that's an important tip. The other thing is that some people use the shutter to focus and obviously to fire the shutter and other people use the button at the back of the uh, top of the camera uh, to engage focus. There's a, there's a button there called AF and you can use that to focus. I personally don't like doing that. In actual fact, I use the AF button in reverse. I customize its use to actually prevent focus. So if I want to track something, uh, I do that using the shutter, and then if I want to stop it focusing, I press the AF button on the back. And that way, I only ever need AI service mode, uh, servo mode. I don't need to use any other modes at all. I just use AI servo, and if I want to stop focusing, I press the AF button on the back of the camera. Uh, we've had a load of requests through for your, uh, your macro photography, Jonathan, so you're going to be back, I hope, very soon doing yeah. the same presentation on macro, if you don't mind. Um, okay, let's go through this. Um, shallow depth of field, we talked about that. Um, uh, so let's um, get in started. So basically, somebody's just very, very keen on photography, not really looking to do it for anything other than just passionate photography. Um, what's, what's kind of the basic kit that they physically need to kind of get going with shooting in the lights of some of the shots that you've got in the garden? Right. Uh, in the back garden, uh, what I would suggest is that you, you obviously get a digital SLR ideally. Uh, failing that, get a high quality, um, I was going to say point and shoot, that's a doggish return. You know what I mean, don't you? Uh, a, a digital camera with a, a reasonable focal uh, length lens on it. But if, if at all possible, make sure you get a, a digital SLR. The next thing is uh, you're going to need a telephoto lens or a zoom lens. If you're going to buy a telephoto lens, I would suggest a 400 millimeter or a 300 millimeter, and you may then buy, in addition to that, a 1.4 converter. Uh, I personally use uh, a 100 to 400 mil lens because I, I find it convenient. The, what, the Canon 100 to 400 is very often maligned uh, because people say they don't get sharp images with it, uh, but that's usually because they've not micro adjusted the lens to get the optimum performance out of the lens. Um, I have a love-hate relationship with mine, um, mainly because I've dropped it once or twice and the stabilizer doesn't always work, in fact it's not working currently but I do get very nice sharp images out of it. So in short, you want an SLR, a zoom lens, minimum 300 mils length, ideally up to 400 mils length. Uh, if you're going for a, a telephoto, minimum 300, ideally 400 or more. Uh, and if you've got plenty of money, there's a, a, a new lens that was launched fairly recently, the Canon 200 to 400, uh, but that is extremely expensive and I'm, I, I personally wouldn't buy it, I think it's far too expensive for what it is. 
Brilliant. Um, just stay on the equipment for a minute, if you don't mind. Uh, mm -hmm. A couple of things. Um, I suppose I'll address the one question first, if you don't mind, because that's quite a common one as well. Is about uh, when when you're photographing in in your garden, are you mm -hmm. shooting from inside the house? Is it a window open through glass, or are you in a hide or a shed, or what have you got? Uh, I am in a hide, and the hide I, I I use several different hides. I bought a cloth hide. Um, that is mobile, obviously, and then I ended up making a garden trellis, and I've grown honeysuckle and uh, various things through that, and I actually hide behind the trellis now. Uh, and then on the other side of the garden, I've got um, a large garden shed that I use as a gymnasium, and there's a window that opens in there, and I can sit in there and take photographs from there. Now, the key thing to bear in mind is, if you're going to put a hide in the garden, bear in mind the time of the day that you're most likely to be taking images. Because light, as everybody knows, is the all important thing. But it's the direction of the light. And then coupled with that, you've got to bear in mind your background. So whilst you want to be somewhere in the region of 9 to 12, 15 feet maximum away from your subject, if it's a small garden bird, um, you also want to make sure that the distance beyond the bird to the nearest background is more or less double that. And by doing that, you can ensure that you're going to get a nice, clear, muted background. Otherwise, you'll find that you start picking up too much detail beyond the bird. Brilliant. I mean, uh, speaking about hides for, and, and backgrounds and things for a minute, I used to have a, a friend of mine in Cabra Club many, 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 many moons ago, and uh, he used to have a, um, his background was his worst part in his garden, and he used to uh, paint cloth <laughs> different yeah. times of year to match him with the colours of the trees, and he just used to actually go and buy the cheapest paint that he could down at the local DIY store and mm. splash this canvas background with lots and lots of colours or muted or whatever to kind of simulate with it, and, and it was just amazing because everybody just couldn't believe that he was in the right place all the time with the yeah. perfect background with it, you know, a big a big cheat, really like that. Yeah, well, well it, it is, but it's, uh, it's a good idea. In actual fact, I have been known in, in years gone by to use camo material as a backdrop. Um, and um, by making sure that it's suitably out of focus, you tend to lose the regular pattern that's in it. And in any case, if you if you wanted to, you could brush over in Photoshop some of the background to make it a little less regular. But ideally, you want to try and make sure that it's right in the first place, so you don't have to worry about things like that. So many of the backgrounds that you see, well, all of the backgrounds that you've seen in my shots are distant ferns, trees and flowers at the bottom end of the garden. And it's particularly at this time of the year when everything's beginning to die back that you get all the nice colours of gold and red and green and you know and browns and things like that. Brilliant. Um, just speaking about the garden, how, how big is your garden? <laughs> I must have had <laughs> five, five or six questions come through on the same thing. So. Right. Uh, well, it, it is a reasonable sized garden. Um, by that, um, I think it's uh, something like 90 feet long and about 45, 50 feet wide. That's nice. Um, nice. Yeah, uh, and the, the front one is about 45, 45 square, something like that. Um, but uh, as I say, the, the key thing is the distance from you to the subject, probably something for the sake of argument, 10 feet or so. Uh, and then you want a clear space behind your subject, uh, ideally of a minimum of another 15 to 20 feet, ideally. If, and if it isn't, well, you can, you can do things about it, but the further away it is, uh, the better it will be and the softer will be the background. Um, and if you can't quite manage that, then you may have to resort to using as wide an aperture as you possibly can on your lens. Cool. Let's do some of the questions that we had in ahead. I've got some more coming through here, yeah. um, but let's do some of the ones that we kind of go in. So, uh, getting started, lens choice, camera set, settings, best time of the day? What's uh, the best time of day in your opinion? Well, it depends on the time of the year, actually. Um, ideally, um, sort of uh, between about, well, 
the times I actually do it are between around about nine o'clock through till sort of half past ten or eleven. Uh, and then if I've got a really interesting subject, I may continue till later on, somewhere approaching midday. But ideally, I don't shoot during midday because the sun tends to be the highest in the sky. But that is, in actual fact, less of a problem at this time of the year because the sun doesn't get quite so high. And then, of course, in the afternoon is okay as well. But in general terms, I try to avoid midday. But, but if the subject's there, uh, and bearing in mind the amount of light that we have in the UK, I tend to take images all day, but the ideal times are before and after midday. Uh, brilliant. What about um, locations that are around the, U uh, the UK? Any you know, couple that you'd say, look, you know, if you need to go and get birds of prey, I mean, we're seeing that um, bird on the... I daren't say it's an eagle or it's a hawk or whatever because I know I'm wrong, um, but it's a feathered friend with a claw and a big a big beak. Um, any ideas where they can kind of go out and you know pretty much guaranteed to return with some great images? Um, if you want to photograph owls, um, there, there are various places. There's a big, a big um, commonly used place in Leicestershire. I actually don't know the name of it, but if you Google it, you'll find it. Uh, there's a place called Burton Marshes and Park Gate on Wirral, which is near where I live, where uh, they usually appear October, November through to about March, April. Um, and um, eagles, uh, you don't get eagles around here, uh, but you can get them up in the Lake District and, it, and uh, on the Isle of Mull, you can get uh, fish eagles and golden eagles. Um, that they're excellent places to get them. Um, barn owls, uh, th the best thing is to get in contact with your local barn owl trust um, and uh, see if they can give you some tips as to where you might find them. But uh, there are barn owls, um, not, a, not very common birds now, but uh, there are barn owls that are widespread throughout the country. So uh, I, I couldn't tell you any specific place, but if, if you look for local barn owl trusts, you'll be able to find out where they might be. Brilliant. Um, so you've decided on your IS, uh, sorry, your aperture and mm -hmm. kind of lens choice and so on. Obviously, mm -hmm. do you use a variant ISO or what's, what's your kind of minimum shutter right. speed that you shoot with? Yeah, on, on the images that you've seen today, some have been taken as low as ISO 100 and some of them were as high as 1600. Um, you obviously have to tra uh, use the ISO that's uh, most suitable for the lighting conditions at the time. Uh, generally speaking, uh, ISO 400 uh, is a very good starting point. Um, when, when you go outside in the morning, you tend to look at, at the, the daylight and say, well, today it's a, it's a 200 day or it's a 400 day or it's a bit dull, it's an 800 day. But the thing to bear in mind, a sharp photograph that shows a little bit of noise is going to be better than a fuzzy photograph showing no noise. So um, with small garden birds, uh, you can get sharp images as low as the 30th or as a 60th of a second, but usually you're going to be looking uh, for shutter speeds faster than a 250th or something like that. Probably, ideally, you're looking at something like 300th to a 500th of a second would be an ideal shutter speed for small birds and even faster. For larger birds, you can come down a little bit. Um, but as a good starting point, I would consider using, uh, on, on a reasonably bright day, but not a very bright day, something like ISO 400 and looking at f6.1, something like that, and then see what kind of a shutter speed that gives you. And if it gives you something faster than a 250th, then I think that you should be reasonably successful that day. But it all, it all depends on the subject. You see, some birds are fast moving, some birds are, are slow moving, and sometimes they sit still for you. So you have to bear that in mind. But generally speaking, a small bird, a fast shutter speed, a big bird, reasonably fast but not as fast. The image that you've got in front of you now, that, that's a buzzard. Uh, I took that image from a hide, uh, and it was in the local field because we knew we had buzzards around there. And I got permission to put my hide in that field. 
the, uh, the prey is roadkill. It was a pheasant that I found in the road and um, I put it in front of the hide. Probably that would have been in the region of around about uh, 25 to 30 feet from the hide. The reason being, of course, that the buzzard is a much larger bird. And uh, that was taken at, I think, ISO 400, uh, and the aperture would have been around about 5, 6, 6.3, something like that. Uh, hopefully, as I'm talking to you, I'll be able to find the image, and I'll let you know in a couple of moments. So if you've got another question, I'll come back to that one for you. Perfect. Yeah, just a couple of last quick fire questions. I know some pe people have got to leave us. They've got to get back from uh, their lunch. So thanks for joining us, everybody. Uh, just going to finish off with a few questions with Jonathan. And uh, we've recorded this, so it will be up on the Photographer Academy site in the next seven days. Um, Jonathan, just quick, quick fire. Ever use flash? Anything to kind of create yeah. ex extra catch lights and things? Can you explain about your, light, yeah. your lighting technique with that? Yeah, uh, with, with flash, uh, you've got to bear in mind uh, how, how powerful your flash gun is and where you're going to position the flash gun. If you can position the flash gun outside the hide and fairly close to the perch, uh, then you quids in really because you can position the angle of the flash precisely where you want it and you can ensure that the catch light is in the sort of direction and position that will be sympathetic to the prevailing daylight. Um, what you'd have to bear in mind is if you're using a fast shutter speed, that you'd have to make sure that the flash was capable of high speed uh, flash synchronization. In other words, if you're using the shutter speed faster than the 250th, can you get that flash gun to synchronize with the camera at that particular speed? Because some cameras you would only be able to use a 250th, uh, and you may find that a 250th wouldn't be adequate. Um, the other thing is, I always use the flash in fill-in mode, never as the primary light source. Otherwise, the birds would look as though they were all taken at midnight. Does that, does that sort of help? It does a lot, thank you. Um, okay, to capture owls, what's the best time of day? To, is it early in the morning or in the, e uh, the evenings? Depends on the subject. Uh, barn owls, owls yeah. uh, they, they tend to be a little bit later in the day, uh, bearing in mind um, the season, you see in November, um, late in the day is probably five, six o'clock, isn't it? Uh, whereas it is not, you know, it's, it's probably more like six to seven o'clock now uh, at this time of the day, at uh, this time of the year. Um, with regards to the um, sh um, short-eared owls, uh, I'm hesitating to say a specific time. I would say any time after dawn up until dusk, <laughs> literally. Uh, I usually, I, I usually uh, got lucky between about 9 and 11 and then probably 3 o'clock onwards. But having said that, it was throughout the day. But barn owls tend to be a bit later in the day before dusk or, or just after dawn. Brilliant. And finally, a couple of quick, quick fire ones really. Um, aperture priority or manual mode, which is your option? Um, well, both, it depends. Uh, in general, I use aperture mode by far and away the most. If I'm going to do flight photography, I would uh, aim the camera at something that was neutral, take that meter reading and then set the camera to manual and use that meter reading. And then it wouldn't matter then whether the bird was against the sky or against the tree or whatever. The, aperture, the uh, exposure should be correct. And finally, what about post, uh, the post-production? Do you do a lot of post-production to your images? Only when necessary. I try and get as much possible as possible right in the camera. And by that, um, I mean I find that my uh, histogram is one of my best friends, along with my tripod, uh, and I always shoot to the right. And by that, I mean I always make sure that the image is well exposed. And I even risk getting one or two little blinkies. If you know, do you know what I mean by blinkies? Yeah, I do, yeah. Yeah. Overexposure. Oh, yeah, cool. Yeah. Um, and the highlight, yeah. Flat. Yeah, because remember, the, the image that you're seeing on the back of the camera is not the raw image, that is a JPEG. So if you've only got a few little blinkies showing every now and again, you'll be able to recover that in your raw conversion. And obviously the question is, do you shoot raw or J, JPEG? <laughs> you answered that. 100% raw. Good, good, good. 
Brilliant. Um, Jonathan, thank you so, so much for giving us such a, a fantastic webinar today at lunch time. I think Jay um, is posting the registration for John Rowell's lan landscape webinar um, for tomorrow lunchtime. In fact, really, if you haven't registered for that already, get in there. Uh, it's going to be another brilliant day again. Uh, Jonathan, thank you very, very much. Uh, I'm sure we'll be nagging you very, very soon to come back and talk about your um, macro photography in the garden and so on. It'd be really great, and perhaps uh, we can convince you to kind of spend one of the days with our video crew and things really and see if we can kind of get you shooting live as it were. Um, remember you can get to Jonathan's uh, website with some of the links that we posted in the chat panel. We'll also put that on our Facebook page later on today. And remember, of course, Jonathan offers some one-to-one -one training if you're looking to actually get out with him and treat yourself, uh, get in touch with Jonathan direct via his website anyway. Uh, to, uh, Jonathan, anything you want to finish off, off, off with? Anything, last messages, last yeah. advice? Yeah, the, the only advice that I would like to say uh, is that please, 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 whenever you're photographing wildlife, always remember that the needs of the subject are paramount to the needs of the photographer. Always think of the subject, don't inconvenience the subject, never put it in peril and never inconvenience it. The subject is always more important than the shot. If you could uh, stress that for me, please. and. Um, I'd just like to say thank you very much indeed for having me. Uh, I've really enjoyed it, and I do look forward to seeing you all again. Perfect. Thanks very much, Jonathan. Again, remember, everybody, um, uh, we have recorded today's webinar. It's going to be on the Photographer Academy site within the next seven days, probably quicker than that, in fact. Um, if you've got any requests of anybody that you'd like to actually see on our lunchtime web webinars or evening web webinars, please get in, in touch with the team via support on the, web uh, the website, and we'll try and make your wishes come true, as it were. When, once again, thanks from me and Jay, who's been on the question panel, actually doing quite a lot, even though he hasn't said anything today. Um, he's been busy away there, kind of thing. And thank you once again to uh, fantastic photographer uh, Jonathan Ashton for some amazing photogra photography and don't forget tomorrow we're back again at lunchtime with another great webinar tomorrow it's on landscape photography if you're interested as well on the 16th uh, we've got some hard ed uh, hitting edgy uh, photojournalism uh, I don't think it's right for one o'clock at lunchtime to be honest I've seen some of the images but we've uh, we, we're, we're there at one so kind of watch out on the photographer Academy and on our Facebook page as well to actually kind of make use use of it that's it. That's enough from me. I'm Mark Cleghorn. Enjoy your lunch or go back to work. I'm Mark Cleghorn for the Photography Academy. See you next time. Bye-bye.